The cover for this presentation, the magazine cover, is Nature, Nature London. It's one of the premier geology magazines, I guess premier science magazines you can possibly read. So between science and nature, they cover pretty much every discovery. So today, this is not Nature magazine, obviously, you know, but it's a knockoff of that. And so I don't know, I guess I'm paying a little bit of an homage to all the things that have been influential to different people over the years and trying to make a cultural connection, I guess. So here we have Great Worm Head. That's the photo in the background here. So I'm going to show you some more photos of that. But by during by Carboniferous time, okay, so in in the United States, we refer to the Carboniferous, we used to refer to it, in fact, as two different time periods. And those time periods were the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian. They were named by different people, but over the years, Carboniferous became the dominant sort of name that you refer to them combined okay so when you combine them we really talk about the mississippian being the lower carboniferous and the upper carboniferous would then be the pennsylvanian and uh so if you go to britain for instance they call it the carboniferous they call the mississippian in fact a part of the carboniferous they call it the dynantian there it's named for a place in in belgium um, and for the Pennsylvanian, they just call it the, the upper carboniferous. And so it's, in fact, the coal measures is the number one rock unit that's exposed there. And so, but in fact, the Dynantian can have a whole series of different units that are exposed in Great Britain. Uh, and other places over in the, uh, in Northern Europe, I guess you could say. But here in the United States, we call it the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian. So I'll use these terms kind of you know, with abandon here, so not, not not always calling it the lower carboniferous. I may refer to it, in fact, as the Mississippian. And the Mississippian here, it's the local rocks we have right here in Springfield, Missouri. So these are the rocks that compose the Springfield Plateau, essentially. And the Springfield Plateau, we're at the top of it here in Springfield. And there's limestone down below us, about 160 feet of it, in fact, all together. It depends on where you're at in Greene County. But um, yeah, we have a lot of limestone in this area. So that is the Mississippian, we call it, around here, or lower Carboniferous. Uh, Pennsylvanian, those are the sort of rocks that you get around Kansas City. And so Kansas City has Pennsylvanian age rocks. And that was a time when not so much shallow seas. There were some shallow seas, of course, but it was more of a swampland in the land environment areas. So there were still carbonates, in, but dirty carbonates for the most part. And so when you talk about Mississippian rocks, you're talking about mostly very clean carbonates across much of the mid-continent region. So, uh, and in fact, so when we talk about what's going on during the Carboniferous, it was a time when all of the continents got together and we formed Pangaea. So that is going to be what's happening at this time. And so we've, we, we have as a result of the Carboniferous, the tectonism that was going on, then we have the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and there's, you know, other things that, that formed at that time as well, but the Appalachians are the lasting result of a collision with Laurentia and the rest of the world, pretty much. And so that's what Pangaea was. It was a supercontinent that combined pretty much everything. And remember that Gondwana is a key part of that, of, of Pangaea as well, but it's an ancient continent that dates all the way back to Cambrian time. And so Gondwana includes South America, Africa, India, Madagascar, Australia, and Antarctica. And so those were all parts of Gondwana. And at that time, at least during the late Pennsylvanian, there was glaciation that began. There was some probably in the Mississippian as well, but it's not as well known. And it's uh, and certainly in, in Laurentia, in the place that's going to become uh, eventually North America, uh, we're going to have some glaciation, mostly during the Pennsylvanian. So we're going to get to that. And then lastly, there's one last time period that is covered with glaciers in Gondwana. But here in North America, we don't see any result of that. In fact, we had deserts mostly at this time in North America, in, in Laurentia. But we had something develop off the West Coast, and that the West Coast at that time was West Texas. And so we had the Permian Basin develop. So I'm going to show you some photographs of these things first. We're going to go on a tour. This is your field trip, okay, for the class, really. And it's, uh, I've had this, um, I'm a carbonate sedimentologist, really, by training. You know, I teach life of the past because I've also had paleo as part of my under, my. Well, I had a great paleo class as an undergraduate at Missouri State University, but then I also had 
uh, uh, training as, as a master's student at the University of Kansas. And so, uh, in fact, the uh, and that combination, it's, it's a weird combination between uh, carbonates and, and paleontology, but, but that's what I am. That's what I do. So we're going to look at the carbonates first here in the Mississippian. I've had this extraordinary chance in my career to see carbonates pretty much all over the United States and, in fact, even in Britain. And uh, but mostly just Britain, I think I guess I've seen some maybe in in the mainland part of Europe as well, but but mostly in Britain. So we're going to go here first. That's called Great Wormhead. Now, Great Wormhead is on the south coast of Wales. Now, Wales is off the west coast of Britain. OK, so Britain's the uh, Great Britain is the name of the island. And so this is off the, the south part of Wales. Then, so Wales is a country that kind of sticks out into the the Irish Sea there. So Great Wormhead, in fact, gets flooded with water in between. Now, in low tides, you can actually walk out to Great Wormhead. And Great Wormhead is that peak that you see in the far distance here. And so that is a limestone of Mississippian or Dinantian age in that case. Um, so we're going to talk about these. The early Carboniferous rocks saw a return to a warm climate in Laurentia anyway, and carbonate rocks were deposited. Carbonate rocks tend to be deposited in, in tropical or semi-tropical, subtropical sort of settings. And it became the dominant rock in the Mississippian sub-period in many parts of the world, including the United States. And so I'm going to show you some of those from the United States, but there's also local rocks around Springfield. You drive around Springfield at all and you see the road cuts. Those are Mississippian age limestones, which is kind of cool. Um, we use them for building things. So we're, we are kind of the Saudi Arabia for limestone, I guess you could say, for building roads and buildings and things like that. So you can make cement out of it. You can make aggregate out of it. So concrete is one of the major products that we do here in, in, in the Springfield Plateau. Uh, Mississippian rocks are also in the Rocky Mountains, and they make their way all the way up to Alaska. And the place where you get the most sandstones and shales out of the Mississippian, those are on the backside of the Appalachian Mountains. And so on the, just on the west side of the Appalachian Mountains, you get there what you, you have a whole series of, of limestones and, and sands, or excuse me, sandstones and shales as opposed to limestones instead because of that orogeny. Okay, so you're building the mountains up and those mountains become weathered and uh, eroded. And so it leaves behind a... Uh, a, a legacy, I guess you could say, of sandstone and shale then. So we're going to look at these things in some detail. And uh, so the uh, antler orogeny, by the way, is still continuing on the west. And so the Acadian gave way to the Appalachian orogeny. And so here we go. We're going into a field trip here. So in that field trip, in fact, Starts here at Great Wormhead. So here you get another view of it. In fact, a little bit different angle on it here, but Great Wormhead, that's the head out there at the end of that on the right-hand side, upper right-hand side. So those are Mississippian age limestones. You're going to get used to this. Uh, you, when you look at these things, very commonly they're, well, sometimes they're dark, but most of the time they're light, either whitish or, or sort of grayish in color. Blue-gray is a very common color for limestone. And then also sometimes you get like really dark grays uh, as well. Here you can see Great Wormhead from a different angle. There's a little natural bridge there. So you can walk out here. And this is a photograph I took from that hill that's overlooking the head there uh, from the previous uh, slide here. But that is Great Wormhead. And you can see all the bedding here dipping towards the head itself. And the head itself is actually dipping towards the south there. So that's the Irish Sea out there in the disc. Actually, it's not quite the Irish Sea. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Um, it's... If you look across there, you can actually see land in the far distance out there. That's Pembroke, or Pembrokeshire, as some people call it. And uh, that is the very tip of Wales. And that is in the Irish Sea when you when it, it, it is uh, pointed into the Irish Sea there. There's walking trails all over Wales. If you haven't had a chance to visit Wales, make sure you do at some point in your life when you can still walk. And uh, you can you can see things like this. This is at Oxwich Beach. Now, this was voted the number one beach in all of Britain. And it was completely, well, almost completely deserted. I think I saw two people on the beach the day that I was there. And this was taken in a September afternoon, I think it was. They, they were, to, to their credit, actually, there was a, a wedding going on in a hotel that's on the beach just off to the left-hand side there. But uh, 
It was kind of a stormy day, I guess. Not too many people wanted to walk that day, but that's looking across at a place called Three Cliffs Bay. And so this is on the Gower Peninsula as the the, the tip of the Gower Peninsula is where Great Great Wormhead is a is a, a town called uh, uh, Ross Ely. Ross Ely is the name of the town at the very end of the peninsula there. So this is Oxwich here. Um, and if you go farther, and I walk the entire peninsula here at various times, it's about 20 miles around, something like that. Uh, here is the Mumbles right here. And so they have a, because it's a rocky set of islands, there are three islands that are separated from the mainland here. And the name of the town is the Mumbles. And so the Mumbles has a lighthouse on it. And so you can walk out to the lighthouse during low tide. You just got to make sure you get back before high tide. Um, this was actually a group of students who were out here mapping and looking at form lines. In fact, they were looking at the structures that were exposed here. So this is a series of synclines and anticlines here. We haven't really talked about that in, in this class, of course, because that's not the focus for this class. But they're really geologic structures from the collision of, of in this case, um, Britain with the rest of Europe here. And so that is the mumbles here. So I'm going to take you on a trip in the United States next here, and we're going to start up in Alaska up there on the upper left-hand side. We're going to go through the Rocky Mountains, take a little sachet out to uh, Nevada. We'll take and look at some rocks in uh, New Mexico, and then we're going to go on down to, um, well, pretty close to Texas there, but uh, but I think it's actually still in New, Mex New Mexico here. Oh, the Grand Canyon. That's Grand Canyon, then New Mexico. And then we're going to come back up through uh, Arkansas, Missouri. And then finally, we're going to get, a, uh, get to take a look at some of the sandstones and shales that are up there, at least the sandstones that are in eastern Kentucky. So that's an area where there's actually some coal that's associated with the Mississippi. And typically, it's not coal. But uh, usually, the coal is in the Pennsylvanian age rocks. But no, there's certainly some sandstone and shale there. So if, and I don't have a really good image of this, but this is an area on this image here. I got to fly around in helicopters here. Actually, it was wonderful. Uh, spent about three weeks there flying around in a helicopter, mapping some of the geology. If you look on this, there's a place called Red Dog Mine down here. Now, that's the world's largest lead zinc mine, and it's actually exposed over here in the kind of the yellowish sort of area. That's where the mine is. And there's so much lead, uh, so much zinc there. In fact, that's the number one thing that they mine there. It's like 75% zinc ore uh, in this prospect and when they first found it. And so it's enormous amount of zinc wealth there. Uh, they mine it and then they truck it to the coastline where it's loaded on a ship and they take it over to Japan where it's then smelted. And so they produce the zinc actually in Japan at a smelter there. Because there's a lot of toxins, actually, when you actually fire these things up and you get and drive off the sulfides in order um, to uh, to extract the uh, the zinc out of it. It's a, it's a mineral called sphalerite, in fact. So sphalerite is the mineral that is mined here at Red Dog Mine. As a byproduct of that, however, you also get a mineral called galena. And so galena is a lead ore. So PBS is the chemical formula for that. Uh, plumium is the PB there, so that is a lead sulfide, and so the lead, the the zinc sulfide ZNS here. I said sulfate earlier, I think, but it's actually a sulfide. But when you when you drive off that sulfide when you smelt it, uh, it adds to a lot of air pollution. So we don't do that in the United States anymore, but we truck it over to uh, the coastline where we can ship it off to another country and they can pollute. So I guess their rules aren't as tough as ours, maybe. Um, what I got to do here was I got to do stratigraphy and mapping some of those rocks that are in the, in the middle part on the left-hand side here. That's called the Woolick Peaks area, and that's the Woolick River that runs in between, just on the east side of those, uh, of those mountains there. So this is a Google Earth image, obviously, here, but, uh, yeah, fascinating rocks in here. So I just more... A lot of my photographs were actually pre-digital cameras from back then, and so I have some photographs from back then, but not too many of them. And I know I scanned them somewhere, but I couldn't find them for this presentation, but I wanted you to see these are Cambrian, excuse me, Mississippian age rocks from the northwestern corner of Alaska. So these things stretch all across the western United States and through the middle part as well. 
here's what it looks in the type area for the Mississippi and in, you know, in, in the United States. This is in Montana. In fact, well, it's the type area for the Madison limestone anyway. In, in the western United States, in Montana, there's a place called Three Rivers or Three, Three Forks, I think it is actually. So Three Forks is this, uh, is this area that has three rivers that come together. There are the Yellowstone, the Madison, and the Gallatin Rivers. They all come together to form the Mississippi, uh, excuse me, the Missouri River there. So that's the Missouri River that you're looking at right here. They, the, the other three rivers come together just south of where this uh, photograph was taken here. And so that's the Madison limestone up through here. Again, Mississippian aged limestone uh, exposed in the middle of, uh, of Montana, not, not the middle, probably kind of the middle western part of Montana, I guess you could say there. So that's uh, Three Forks. Uh, the next uh, stop along the way here, this is in the Beaverhead Mountains. And so this is where my wife did her master's thesis. And she mapped some of the Madison there as well. So here you get, again, you see the Madison. I got to work on the Madison uh, when I was working with Mobile uh, pre-merger before they join, joined together with Exxon. And so uh, at Mobile, we were looking at a gas play out in western Wyoming, in fact. And so we were out doing stratigraphy in the mountains of western Wyoming and in other places around there, in fact. So we tried to figure out exactly what's going on there. This is the uh, the Madison limestone, however, in the Beaverhead Mountains, and that's Nancy walking down the road there next to her car there at the time. Um, one of, this is where I actually got to work. I found this uh, postcard. So most of the photographs I have for this also were slides that haven't been scanned yet. But in fact, that's the sort of view that we had when we were working out here uh, with mobile and uh, looking at some of these. So that's, that's uh, Hoback Canyon here. So if you drive through western Wyoming and you're driving up towards, um, towards uh, well, first the first place that you would get to, in fact, would be uh, Hoback Junction. That's where the Snake River and the Hoback River come together. And uh, a little bit north of that is a place called, uh, um, what do they call it, uh, it's Jackson Hole. Jackson Hole. So Jackson Hole is a little bit north and west of this. And north of Jackson Hole, of course, is the Teton Range. And so Teton National Park is up there. And a little bit north of that, in fact, there's a parkway in between there, Roosevelt Parkway, I think it is, uh, or Rockefeller Parkway. And then above that, in fact, you get to Yellowstone National Park. And so I mean, Wyoming is a huge state area-wise, okay? Not population-wise, but area-wise. So this is Hoback Canyon right here. Um, quite a beautiful place, kind of the west central part of Wyoming here. If you get into eastern Wyoming, there's uh, there's mountains all over Wyoming, okay? Um, and so this is an area called the Bighorn Mountains. And in the Bighorn Mountains, there is Bighorn Canyon here. And again, the Madison limestone crops out here. Now, I think the lowest unit here that you see on the right-hand side is going to be the Bighorn Dolomite here. But in fact, the Madison crops out above that. And so massive amounts of carbonate back during Ordovician time for the, for the Bighorn and then for the Madison, that's Mississippi in an age. Quite a, quite a luxurious carpet of limestone that was deposited during the Mississippi. And so if you can imagine, like the entirety of, of the United States at that time, Laurentia, would have looked like the top of the Bahama Bank. It's like the Great Bahama Bank everywhere, you know, at least in the western part of the U.S. and central part of the U.S. as well. Here you can see some Mississippian strata from Nevada. Well, this is actually western Utah. This is in the Confusion Range. And uh, that's the Joanna limestone. Just below that, in fact, is what we call the Pilot Shale. So the Pilot Shale is Devonian in age. I mean, some of it may actually be partly Mississippian also at the very top of it. But if you recall, we talked about the, the Chattanooga Shale when we talked about the late Devonian. We said everything went anoxic back then. And it did here as well. So the pilot shale is this organic rich black shale that is overlain in this case by, you know, what would have been tropical or subtropical carbonates here, but probably a little bit deeper water than what you've seen so far. But that's in west central Utah here. And we say this, the same rocks show up again, okay, when you're in the Grand Canyon. And so they're very famous, in fact, in the Grand Canyon. If you, if you look in the foreground here on the left-hand side, you can see that big cliff that's in the middle part of the slope there. 
It's called the Red Wall Limestone. So the Red Wall Limestone is Mississippian in age. The, the rocks below it, in fact, are Cambrian in age. Yes, there may be a little tiny bit of Devonian in there, but not much. And they do find some freshwater fish in the Devonian rocks that are in the Grand Canyon. But it's actually hard to see the Temple Butte Formation. That's the name of the Devonian rocks that are in the Grand Canyon area. Now, the rocks above the Red Wall Limestone are red shales and red sandstones, and with a few carbonates in there as well. But because that red shale weathers and forms a slope, that red clay covers the the red wall limestone so the red wall limestone itself it only gets that red color from the rocks that are above it okay so the shales just kind of blanket over the top of the exposures of the red wall limestone but the red wall limestone is pretty famous and so you can trace it over here on the left you can see where it stretches around the grand canyon in fact you can go across the grand canyon and see it on the opposite bank of the Grand. In fact, that's just the opposite bank right across, right across over there. By the way, that's called the inner gorge. These rocks that are dark in the middle part here, that's where the, the canyon cuts the deepest, right there in the inner gorge. Okay, these are rocks from, from southeastern New Mexico, and these are famous as well. You wouldn't know it maybe, but, but I do know it, and it's in the Sacramento Mountains here. And these are Mississippi and uh, Strata as well. I think that's called the Doña Ana, Doña Ana and the uh, Alamacito maybe. I, I can't remember the exact names for these things. But in these rocks, you get these unusual features. They're called uh, mounds, mud mounds, in fact. And so the origin of these mud mounds has been quite uh, controversial over the years. And a lot of people think that they're essentially reefs. But... Uh, I think they're mostly like slumps and things that actually accumulate on a slope. And of course, this was on the edge of what would, what would become the Rio Grande Rift here. And so Sacramento Mountains were fault bounded on the left hand side here. But all of those rocks that are in that, uh, you know, above uh, the uh, the weathering slope here above that talus uh, is, in fact, those are Mississippian age rocks until you get to the very top up there. Those might be a little bit of Pennsylvania in there maybe in the holder formation, but I'm not sure if you can actually see the holder from, from this angle here. Um, so Muleshoe Mound is in the Sacramento Mountains here. Now, I work in a place in central Missouri. Now, I already talked about, like, the Springfield Plateau being Mississippian in age. It's also Mississippian in age when you get up around Osceola, and you wouldn't know it when you're there, except if you're on the river, or well, this used to be the Osage River here, if you are along that river, and here we were with kayaks this one day, this is an area, in fact, that was struck by a meteorite back during Mississippian time. At the age of the, well, the age when all of these rocks were accumulating around Springfield here, that's when a meteorite struck this area a little bit south of Osceola, a little town called Vista. And so just a little bit south of Vista, they call it the Wablo structure, named for Wablo Creek, which runs on the east side of this thing. But uh, but in fact, when that when that thing hit, you can see those massive cliffs over on the left hand side. It shook those cliffs so much that there's no bedding planes and you don't see any rocks that are nicely bedded like you would expect to find. In fact, they're just kind of massive for that entire hundred and about 120 feet thick here. Um, over here on the right hand side, you can see Brandon Zates there. Actually, Brandon is a former student at Missouri State University. I think he went to work for an oil company for a while, but I'm not exactly sure what he's doing now. But here you can see something we call knuckles, in fact. So this is a fold right there. It's a broken fold. You can actually see where the break was. And you can see that those rocks were actually deformed. And it was deformed by that impact. The impact itself caused the rocks to be pushed, essentially, and folded like a rug. And so that is a little anaclinal sort of fold right there. And, um, and chunks of other rock have been weathered out around it here. So you can see that. So that's a Truman Reservoir in Osceola. Just a little bit uh, upstream from Osceola before you get to the confluence with the Sauk River there. Um, if you were to fly out of an airport at Branson, you would see these rocks. Now, this is the Branson Airport Road. And here you can actually see the unconformity at the base of the Mississippian here. That's about where the car is parked there. There's a little tiny thin sandstone, but it's no more than six or eight inches thick there. And there's some carbonates down below that, but in fact, just above, about where that car is, the Mini Cooper is parked there. Those are all limestones all the way up. Now, some of them are red, and there's a little tiny green layer of siltstone in there as well. 
But for the most part, those are carbonates. And so that's called the Compton uh, Formation, Compton Limestone down here at the bottom. The Bachelor Formation is that thin sh uh, shale and sandstone at the base of the Mississippi in there. And then the red, sort of variegated uh, red and white sort of beds, those are uh, above the Northview Formation, that siltstone, in fact, you get into the Pearson Limestone above that, in fact. So it's a little bit thicker than normal here. So that is kind of the rocks that you see in the Branson Airport road cuts there. Um, if you're to go down to Arkansas now, you know, so we're making our way across the continent and then uh, meandering a little bit in this mid-continent region here. Here you can see the goat trail. So there's a person standing on the goat, goat trail over there, and that is in an area called Big Bluff. And that overlooks, in fact, if you're to look to the right from the, uh, the trail there, you can see the Buffalo River down about 300 feet below you. So it's quite steep there, and so people will hike this trail all the time uh, just to, you know, for the magnificent views that are down here. And so that is the Goat Trail on Big Bluff. On the right-hand side, you can see this massive limestone there, but at the very base of it down there, that's a cave. Uh, it's not a big cave. It doesn't go anywhere, but it's what we would call a shelter bluff cave. And so it was uh, inhabited by Native Americans for a long period of time, I'm sure. Uh, so these are the sort of features that you would see. Now, there's a little waterfall next to this. So you have water, you have shelter. And in fact, there's even a cave up higher. You can you can scramble up the slope a little bit if from where this uh, photograph was actually taken here. And uh, that's about where the mouth of the cave is there. And you can actually look out of the cave and see this giant bluff there. And so that's in Lost Valley. It's part of the Buffalo National River. Uh, it used to be a state park, I think, but now it's a federal park, federally administered park. Um, if you drive from Springfield, let's say, to Fayetteville, Arkansas, you would drive right through here. This is I-49 now, so it used to be Highway 71, I-49. It got widened, and uh, there's a new section of road in here as well. But they cut these magnificent road cuts here, of course, Geologists, that's where we get the most information about everything here. So here we are looking at some of these uh, road cuts from the top of this road cut right here. And you can look down. And uh, this is an area that uh, they produce oil and gas out of when you're in southern Kansas or northern Oklahoma. And so, uh, and these rocks, in fact, are Mississippian in age also. Every rock that you can see here is Mississippian in age. Now, it's a lot of limestone in the foreground here, but there's also some chert. So that ledge is just covered with chert that's broken out of that uh, out of that road cut there and deposited on a ledge essentially that's in this uh, in this cut here. Now here we are at the base of these rocks here. So uh, over on the left hand side where those gray rocks are exposed, that's part of the Chattanooga Shale there, or rocks that are equivalent to the Chattanooga. Locally they call it the Knoll uh, Shale there. Uh, but here you can see a colleague of mine from Missouri State University. This is Damon Bassett, who also teaches this course, by the way. And so Damon is uh, scaling the uh, the cliff here in order to collect samples of the Compton limestone here. So that's the Compton limestone that we see here. Uh, that The area at the top of this uh, first uh, bench right there, that is the Northview Formation. And above that, again, is the Pearson Formation. So those are local rocks around here. Um, this is an area called Jane, Missouri. I got to, to take a bunch of students down here to do geologic mapping. In fact, right now we're actually mapping the adjoining quadrangle that's just west of this, and that is in the, uh, in the Knoll quadrangle. And so Knoll is really quite an interesting place as well. And here's a photograph of it right here, in fact. So this is the highway that runs next to Knoll right here, and you can see how these rocks pinch out. There's a a shale below and a shale above here, and then massive limestones above that. And so that is the Pearson Formation at the very top up there, the Northview Formation that kind of pinches out in the middle ground there. And that's the, going to be the uh, the Compton down here at the very bottom. So, and again with the students, we're we're checking out this uh, this area here. Okay, for some contrast. Finally, we're in eastern Kentucky here, and this is a place called Natural Bridge. This is in the Red River Gorge scenic area of eastern Kentucky. And it is absolutely, it's absolutely stunning, the beauty here. But that's a sandstone uh, arch right here, essentially. These arches form when all the rocks underneath that are more easily weathered out, they just drop away and then melt away, essentially, when they're eroded and weathered and eroded. And so most of the materials there are removed. Uh, but that's an arch. It's not going to be around forever. So if you get a chance, go see it. Um, but that's in Red River Gorge in the eastern part 
of Kentucky. So the Mississippi. Time of cr uh, crinoids for the most part. It's a time of well, pretty much everything is around back then, but uh, but in fact, it's uh, in this area, if you're in Springfield, you would see all these crinoids almost everywhere. In fact, just outside of Temple Hall here at Missouri State University, we have crinoids in some blocks that were moved there during some construction. So you find these blocks actually in the subsurface and, and very commonly they'll actually weather to become discrete individual boulders essentially. And so three of those boulders got moved to the north side of Temple Hall. Um, but what are crinoids? Uh, so crinoids are what you would find in the limestones mostly around Springfield. Crinoids essentially are called sea lilies. That's one of the terms that people refer to these things as. And they're an echinoderm. If you can imagine like a starfish at the end of a stalk, that's kind of what, what they look like. Except they they ate their food. They, they captured their food by turning those, those arms into the current. And those pinnules would allow them to filter feed out of the currents. And so if you can imagine, it was like a forest of crinoids in the seafloor. And so when these crinoids would die, they would fall apart. And those pieces are what make up the limestone, in fact. Every once in a while, you get lucky and you can actually find stem pieces that may be two, three, four inches long sometimes. But here you can see some of these crinoids, in fact, that are, that uh, this shows you the diagram of what a crinoid would look like. They filter feed and then they were able to eat. Well, their mouth is in that aboral cup here, and so aboral means below the, or the oral uh, cavity, if you will. And so that's where they would take and digest the food that they would get in the form of protozoans and things like that. They would filter out of the currents. And there's going to be tons of these things, so these things would have been littering the seafloor, perhaps no more than 20 or 30 feet deep. And so there were, there were lots of these things. And so the estimate is that in every cubic meter. I think there were something like 40,000 crinoids that are represented by what that cubic meter of rock would uh, have represented in the number of, of animals that were there. So crinoids, in fact, are animals. Even though they're called sea lilies, they're not really a plant. They're not a vascular plant. They're a vascular animal, however, and so they are able to transmit nutrients down to the roots of these things, and they would grow upward through time. And so they would add on uh, columns, essentially, and so there would be a tissue on the outside to help secrete these things. There's a lot of interesting things about crinoids. Now, it is the state fossil, too, so that is important as well. So if a, cri if a crinoid is the state fossil in Missouri, we, you should probably learn about them then. Um, these things secrete their skeletons out of calcite. Now, calcite is the number one mineral constituent of limestone. It's CaCO3. It's a form of carbonate rock, essentially, or carbonate mineral, right? And the other one that you've learned already is aragonite, which is also CaCO3, but aragonite can be converted to calcite. But in fact, this, these are what we regard as high magnesium calcite. So in other words, there's a lot of magnesium, about 15% or more, in a crinoid skeleton. And so what it does to the limestones, in fact, it makes them more soluble. And so because of that, we have a lot of caves in the Springfield Plateau. And so, you know, high mag calcite is one of those reasons. And so if you look at any of the road cuts around Springfield and wherever you can see it, where it looks kind of grainy, those are going to be crinoids. And those crinoids get what we call cutters and pinners, cutters and pinnacles locally around here. The weathering pattern is called cutters and pinnacles. So these, in, these in fact, are echinoids. They're, they're, they're related to echinoids. Uh, they are echinoderms, and so they're related to sea urchins. They're related to starfishes, but, in fact, crinoids are their own branch of echinoderm. And um, so, in, in fact, the, as they secrete the columnals, they're, they're secreted out of a single crystal of calcite, the high mag calcite. And, so, and they're actually a little bit porous. And so they're porous because there's like organic material that would have been growing and would have been helping to secrete these tissues, right? And so that's why they're porous, in fact. And so they're fairly lightweight, sort of hydrodynamically, so they move around a lot. So commonly around Springfield, you'll actually see cross-bedded crinoid, what we call a grainstone. So grainstones, in fact, are the accumulations of these ossicles. And every once in a while, you actually see one of the heads. Those are called calyx or calices is the plural version of that. 
Uh, so the stalks, stalk pieces are mostly what you see. And sometimes they don't show them on this diagram, but sometimes they put out little spikes on these things as well. And those things, in fact, are called cirri. So cirri are off the sides of these things as well. And everything is anchored at the bottom with what we call a holdfast. And so the holdfast would hold the crinoid to the bottom. What's interesting about that is the modern living crinoids today. There are living crinoids today, but they're very rare and they're mostly in deeper water. They're able to actually move. And so they can actually crawl around on the seafloor and find the conditions that are right for them. And they still filter feed that way. That's how we know that crinoids did that in the geologic past as well. Okay, here's a crinoid here, for instance. That's a fossil. And I think that's um, Agarina crinus or something like that, I think is the name of that one. But uh, quite a fascinating uh, creature it was. So those plates, are, those are actually on the arms, and you can actually see the pinules sticking off of the arms here as well, or brachials is the other term that people use for that. And the stem, of course, at the bottom there. So that's a crinoid right there. Um, and this tells you more about what I just told you about. So this, they have five-fold symmetry. I didn't get to tell you that part. So if you look at a starfish, very commonly they have five arms, right? And of course, they always say if you chop off the arm, one of the arms of a of a starfish, it could actually grow back, but uh, not good to do that. Okay, so don't do that. And actually, when you remove a starfish from a rock, you're probably going to kill it. So don't do that either. Uh, so don't don't try to <laughs> don't try to collect starfish. Okay, best to leave them in the ocean where you find them. Um, these things are also related to sand dollars and sea urchins as well. So they are pretty pretty cool animals. And so uh, the crinoids here, fivefold symmetry. If you look at starfish, they're usually either five arms or they they occasionally may have six, but um, but most of the time they're going to have 5 or 10 or 15, 20 even, some of them, right? Some of the really large ones that grow in the very far north, like in the in the in uh, in places like the Bering Sea and places like that. They have really large uh, starfish there. But these are different. These are the sea lilies. These are the crinoids. So crinoids slightly different. Now here's a photograph right here that, that shows you some of these uh the stalk pieces, if you will, or columnals, we call them as well. They're also called ossicles. Um, so they stack like a stack of dimes, if you will. And notice that one of them on here is actually oval shaped. That's called platycrinides. And so platycrinides has a little fulcrum in the middle. You can actually see a, uh, it's not really a groove. It's actually a little pivot that is a little raised bump or a little ridge, if you will, right through the middle of that. Now it did have a hole right through the middle of that stalk as well, but if you have a whole stack of these things and they have a little pivot like this, it actually allows them to bend and then face into the current much more easily with a lot more structural rigidity, in fact, than what a round stalk piece would have. And so that's platycrinides, kind of an evolutionary novelty for some of the middle Mississippian sort of crinoids that were around um, during the time of the, uh, the, the local rocks around here. And so that's part of the the Keokuk part of the Burlington Keokuk limestones undivided locally. That's the rock unit that we call that locally around here. We're probably going to come up with a new name for that here, probably this summer, in fact. Um, so if the Mississippian was a time of limestones pretty much everywhere, we go on into the Pennsylvanian. In the Pennsylvanian, I want you to think coal swamps. So coal is one of the major rocks that firm, uh, forms during the Pennsylvanian. And so this is going to be called the late Carboniferous. That's the time period if we talk about the rocks. It's the upper Carboniferous. And so the Appalachian Mountains were forming in the east. And remember, we had collided with Gondwana. In fact, we collided with the African part of Gondwana. So Africa comes in, slams into, or North America, or Laurentia, if you will, slams into Africa in that part of Gondwana. And so Gondwana includes Africa, and once again, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, India, Madagascar, South America. And so all of those are joined together in one massive part of what would be Pangaea. Right? So Pangaea was forming at this time. Laurentia hits, Baltic hits, yeah, Baltica they call it, and Siberia becomes part of this as well. In North China, South China, those are parts around the perimeter of what was known as the Paleotethi Sea. And eventually those are going to be collided from the south and it's going to form the Tethys Sea on the east side of Pangaea. So 
Um, fascinating, uh, the, the paleogeography of this time period. So the Lake Carboniferous is known as the Pennsylvanian. We already talked about that. It's called the Pennsylvanian because, well, there's a lot of those rocks that are exposed in Pennsylvania, especially in the Appalachian Mountains there, and that's where they mined a lot of coal. And so Pittsburgh is that is sort of that area, okay? So they're, And actually some of the first oil wells drilled in, in North America were drilled in that area in the northwestern part of Pennsylvania. And so those oils, in fact, can be traced back to these age rocks as well. Now, if the Mississippian is this time of limestone down here, over the top of that you get an unconformity. Remember we talked about unconformities and relative age dating earlier in here in this semester, in this block? <laughs> um, it's really a massive unconformity across much of North America, but in fact, uh, it didn't last very long, I don't think, you know, but there were parts of the continent that went up and down. And, and in fact, there were big basins that were forming at this time as well in parts of, of North America, parts of Laurentia. And in fact, so we, we had everything all together here. And so we had the swamps. There were massive forests then as well. So it was a pretty equitable climate to begin with. But by the time you get to the end of the Pennsylvania, and uh, it got cold again. And so, in fact, we're going to see that during Pennsylvania time, there's a tendency to have a lot of cyclic sedimentation. Uh, you see that a lot around Kansas City. If you drive around Kansas City at all, at all, you would see limestones and shales. And every once in a while, you might see a sandstone in a few places. But, uh, but mostly uh, limestone and shale, interbedded. But it's very cyclic. And so you get one and then the other and then the other and then the other and then the other one on top of another due to superposition, right? So that's cyclicity, we call that. These cycles are roughly about 400,000 years, so we think that they're probably related to some sort of climatic forcing mechanism that would cause these things to be cyclic like that. So it's the, it's the main rock that you would see. You know, if we, if we earlier saw uh, Osceola on here, those were Mississippian age limestones. If you drive north from Osceola, most of the rocks you're going to see then most of them, not all of them. If you just cross the bridge, you'll see some Mississippian age rocks. But that's pretty much the end of them. <laughs> After that, you get Pennsylvanian age rocks. And so that's kind of the story for this part of Missouri anyway, uh, all the way to Kansas City. And in fact, if you go west from Osceola, you also get to see those sorts of rocks around Nevada, Lamar, other places along the western side of Missouri. So here's our Pennsylvanian age reconstruction for the the, the the paleogeography of that time period. You can see Gondwana down here at the bottom, covering the polar regions, by the way. There's Africa. And so they call it La Russia on here because parts of Russia were also, so the Siberian platform was attached as well. But Laurentia is on here, and you can actually see where the Appalachian Mountains are formed right over here. Kind of in the middle part, about where the second S is in La Russia there. La Russia. That's a combination of parts of Russia. I think it's maybe the uh, the eastern Russian platform, the the the, the, uh, the platform that developed in Poland in that area. Uh, so and certainly parts of uh, of Britain are, are part of this sort of uh, La Russia as well. And then uh, and then uh, the the rest of Britain, in fact, would be on the south side of that, and probably mostly on the east side. Of the, in this reconstruction here. Um, warm currents, cold currents show up on here, but there's a climatic effect that happens when you have a huge land mass like this. In Missouri, in Missouri again, we're going back home here to, just to kind of show you what's going on. Now the town of Clinton is roughly about, oh, maybe not half, yeah, it's roughly halfway between Kansas City and Springfield. And Clinton's about 85 miles north of Springfield. Let me put it that way. Uh, if you went north from uh, Springfield, you would pass through Clinton as you're driving farther along in Highway 7 there. Uh, you'll pass by some strip mines. You wouldn't know it, but those are strip mines. And today, that's part of a conservation area. So those lakes, in fact, are good for fishing. But that's about all. Maybe some hunting there as well. So... It's a land where you can't grow crops anymore because it's been turned into a wetland, essentially. So, yeah, that's part of the legacy of mining coal in an area that probably shouldn't have been mined. Um, I think the very thickest that a coal bed is in that area was about six feet. So they would actually strip mine to get coal that was close to the surface. And so all of these lakes and bodies of water that you see on here 
are related to strip mining. It's a very kind of destructive sort of coal that you can get out of Missouri. Now that is a type of coal, in fact, that is uh, useful for energy, I guess you could say, in the sense that it is a bituminous coal. It's one that you can burn in order to get energy for like power plants and things like that. And that's what they used it for here in Missouri. Uh, there are other types of coal, however. So for instance, if you went to, um, if you went to Pennsylvania, some of the coals in Pennsylvania, in fact, are what we regard as anthracite coals. So this is an image of an anthracite coal or hard coal here. And so hard coals, in fact, um, are also useful for making steel. Uh, not just for energy uses, but you can actually turn that into a product called coke. And so coke uh, is where you fire this material up and it burns very, very hot. And so it's able to be included into high carbon steel, essentially. And so high carbon steel uses, takes advantage of the fact that you can use anthracite for that. So, in fact, many of the steel mills that existed were either in Cleveland or Pittsburgh, you know, back in the early days of the Industrial Revolution in America. And so anthracite coal became an important, important part of that. And so if the Appalachian Mountains had a lot of Pennsylvanian age rocks that were in them, and then they got crushed and deformed somewhat, and so that, in fact, so it was going on even during Permian time. Here you can see an anthracite coal on the, on the right-hand side, and that's an outcrop of it over here on the left-hand side. And notice how it's deformed. It's actually dipping somewhat there in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, so... This was a time, Pennsylvania was a time when we had a lot of ferns and lycopsids. Lycops, these are the things that first started back during the, the Pennsylvania, but the, the uh, excuse me, during the Devonian, but they became very abundant at this time. And so we also developed a new form of plant at this time during Pennsylvania, during the Carboniferous, the gymnosperms came along. And you're probably going, what's a gymnosperm compared to this? Well, this is a photograph of a fern right here. So they would have been around already. You've already seen photographs of that from the Devonian talk here. But but here, in fact, this would be a, uh, a variety of fern tree here that's in the next one here. That's called Sigillaria. And Stigmaria is the root part of that, that uh, fossil here. But you can actually see it's upright. It's actually got buried in some flood, I guess. And so the floods would have come along and buried that sort of log here or that stump, if you will. But in fact, uh, when it comes to gymnosperms, they have a slightly different aspect to them. So gymnosperms would include things like cycads. You're probably going, what's a cycad? Well, a cycad, in fact, is a plant that's still with us today. They grow in the South Pacific. They grow in the Caribbean. Uh, they grow in Central America. I think South America as well. And so cycads, in fact, look something like a... Uh, like a, like a pineapple, I guess you could say. They're not quite pineapples, but you can see one over here on the middle on the left-hand side of this diagram. They they have sort of like fronds that they'll stick out, kind of like a palm tree, I guess you could say. So um, maybe sago palm. I don't think it's sago palm, palms, but uh, but in fact, people do eat uh, cycads, and, and dinosaurs ate cycads. They were around back during the age of dinosaurs as well. So that is a cycad, and so cycads were like spiny, right? And so they had these sort of like fronds at the top, a lot like a palm tree. Uh, but the other things that came around back then, in fact, were the conifers. So the conifers showed up. So conifers, enormously successful. So pine trees, right? Things like pine trees, early, early pine trees would show up. And then things like the ginkgo tree. Well, the ginkgo tree is still around today as well. And they have these sort of fan-shaped leaves, right? And so ginkgo leaves are very common in the fall. You'll see them turn this beautiful yellow color here in Springfield, um, but shaped like a fan, essentially. So it doesn't have a central stem in the leaf. Uh, so ginkgo trees, extremely old. Um, uh, cedar trees, uh, well, not so much cedars, but uh, cypress trees. So cypress trees were around back then as well. Um, the gymnosperms were successful because they were able to develop seeds. Okay, so these are really kind of cool. So they were seed sort of bearing plants. And so they evolved back during the Carboniferous. So what an interesting sort of novel time. And because of that, <laughs> you have forests. Okay, so anywhere where you have mountains, you've got streams that run off of them. And those streams, in fact, would have wetlands associated with them. 
And you get deltas, you get swamps, you get estuaries and things like that. And you have a lot of dead plants around. And so those dead plants would hit the water. And once they got into the water, they could get buried relatively easy in floods and things like that. And next thing you know, as you bury that, it becomes peat material. And peat is kind of like a precursor to coal. So that de dead and decaying plant material, well, if you cut the oxygen off, it's not going to decay anymore. And you actually turn these things into carbon. And so the, the, the proteins, the, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this when we talked about carbonization. So that's how you form a coal. So you, you bury it, essentially, and you turn it into coal. Or it's just nothing but carbon, essentially. It's one of the few rocks, in fact, that doesn't have minerals in it. So carbon is just an element, right? So it's an elemental rock, if you will. So coal is one of the stories. It's a major part of the story for the Carboniferous here. Hence the name Carboniferous, right? The coal majors in Britain. We also had some interesting animals that show up at this time as well. So they're called synapsids, and so we're actually a synapsid ourselves. Now this is all based on really kind of old sort of ideas, but they seem to hold together pretty well uh, in the skull of things that evolved from, from amphibians. Amphibians didn't have any uh, ear holes essentially in their skull, and they had other holes, and so uh, synapsids, in fact, had one set of holes, and that's where our ears are today in mammals. Um, but synapsids would also include things like, uh, well, like most uh, most things that were actually amniotes <laughs> could have been synapsids, I think. And so many of these things, they look like dinosaurs, but they're not. And they're not even reptiles, for that matter. That's called an amniote right there. That's because of the, that's the type of egg that it laid. It laid an amniotic egg. And so for the first time, after you developed amphibians, these amniotes came along. They were able to lay their eggs on dry land, bury them, perhaps, and then walk away. Or maybe not. Maybe they were good mothers. Who knows? Uh, but, but in fact, they have these enormous sails on them. And so the sails tell us a little bit about amniotes as well. And they used to call these pelicosaurs, but... Pelicosaurs, but um, we're pretty sure that they were cold-blooded because why would you have a sail? Well, it's not for locomotion. <laughs> it's not in order to sail, okay? So I don't think so anyway. But these things likely gathered sun and were able to warm up in, in the sun, low sun. You can actually uh, get more active then. So where are the amniotes in this chart? This is a chart that shows you the early tetrapods. So amphibians and amniotes had a common shared ancestry in the tetrapods. And the tetrapods came out of the lobe fin fishes, right? So here you can see the amniotes then were the stem group that gave us the sauropsids and then also the mammals. And so there were things, people used to refer to them as, as mammal-like reptiles, but in fact that's inaccurate because the reptiles is a paraphyletic group in other words, it crosses the trees, different branches of the trees. So, for instance, crocodiles and turtles have more in common with birds and dinosaurs, of course, than they do with the rest of the lizards and the tuataras. Tuatara is a type of thing that looks like a lizard, but it's not a lizard. And it's from uh, New Zealand. And so that's what you get in New Zealand, tuataras on one island there. Um, but snakes and lizards and, and so forth are are a type of sauropsid as well. And so both of those were, you know, came out of the stem group, the sauropsids here. And so reptiles is that paraphyletic grouping that would include the crocodiles, but not the birds in this case. So, um, yeah, so when it comes to the mammals, that's the middle part here. We have shared common ancestry with the sauropsids, but then there was a split, okay? So that uh, letter A on here shows the, the break between the monotremes and then this other group that uh, became you know, the group that we belong to is the eutheria on here. And then the marsupials. And so marsupials and eutheria. The monotremes would include things like the duck-billed platypus. So very unusual sorts of animals. And in fact, I think echidnas also. So echidnas are the other animal that would be belong to the monotremes then. So here you have a diagram that shows you the relationship between what we think today, how we regard reptiles as being that paraphyletic group. But then when we talk about the ancient ancestors of these things, we're really talking about amniotes or amniota 
one here. That's the, the layer B down there that is the break between the mammals and the sauropsids. These weren't labeled, so I had to label them on there for you. Um, so by the close of the Pennsylvanian, if we had this enormous forest, and that enormous forest is going to pump carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere again, and so what's going to happen? Yeah, glaciation. So glaciation strikes again, and we get what they call the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. It's a mass extinction, in fact, but it's not quite as big as the ones we've seen previously. So it's not quite as bad as the one that was at the end of the Devonian. It's not quite as bad as the one at the end of the Ordovician, but it's not quite as bad also as the one we're going to get at the end of the Permian. So I've tried to color code these things on these diagrams as well. So when you go through here, blue usually refers to things that are Mississippian. So that sort of cyan blue. The green color refers to the Pennsylvanian. And the red color on here is going to refer to the Permian. And so the Permian is next on the list. So if we had an, uh, an extinction at the end of the Carboniferous, we go into the next time period. It's called the Permian. And the Permian saw widespread glaciation in South Africa now. So in South Africa, the Dwykatillite was actually one of the deposits that formed there. And so the polar regions are the ones that are going to ice up at this time. And so there was widespread glacial deposits across today what is South America, Australia, and also in uh, Africa. And, and even in Antarctica, there were glacial deposits during this time as well, during the Permian. And so here is our snapshot of what Permian paleogeography would look like. And now we've got this Paleotethes Sea, but you can see all those islands there on the south side of that sea are going to migrate north. And in fact, we're going to form Asia out of that collision that's going to form up there. And so Siberia, in fact, is this Angara uh, sort of area that you see uh, listed on this diagram. People like to write papers to, in order to like get their ideas across and so very commonly they'll pitch names that are going to be lost at some point uh, and so Ankar I assume is probably lost at some point as well but in fact that's what they refer to and it's really Siberia is what it is okay so Permian time saw more amniotes more of these synapsids so there's lots of them around back then they're going to be ancestors of those sauropsids that are soro sauropsids and so the uh, amniotes and the synapsids uh, will be uh, the synapsids are going to give rise to the mammals in other words and the sauropsids will be the ancestors then of the what we regard as that paraphyletic group called the reptiles so the permian carbonates occurred in west texas at this time and in fact it's a place where we have what they call the permian reef complex in the guadalupe national park and so there's a national park in the western part uh, just past the panhandle of Texas, you get to uh, see that sort of area. And it's an interesting time period. If we have glaciation going on in the Gondwana part of Pangaea, in this part of Pangaea, it's a westward-facing ocean out there. And it's a basin that opened up at that time, and it began to fill with carbonates. It was still warm and tropical in that sort of setting, even though it was a time of glaciation elsewhere. And so by the time we got to the end of the Permian, at least towards the last half of the Permian, that basin began to then fill with what we call evaporites. And so you cut off the ocean water and periodically let it flood in. It formed a massive deposit called the Castile Formation. So the Castile Formation, gypsum and uh, dolomite mostly in that. And so, but what the interesting part is, is before those evaporites got deposited in that restricted basin, in fact, we had reefs that ringed that area, that whole Permian Basin area. And so the Permian Basin is associated with reefs, but not your typical reefs. These are not coral reefs. These are not even sponge reefs. They're not even stromatolytic reefs. These are brachiopod reefs of all things. So brachiopod Brachiopods developed this like sort of weird habit at this time where they would look like an open palm almost and then have like a second valve that would cover their lophophore essentially. And so these things were weird shaped. Never see them again in the fossil record, but in the Permian, because this is a special circumstance, they were actually reformers at that time. 
Well, what's the reef look like? Well, here it is today in all of its glory. So this is called the west face of the Guadalupe Mountains. Now, this is an area, again, we're looking at an area that was faulted not that long ago, in fact. And so this is a failed rift through here. And this rift is called the Rio Grande Rift. And so you can see the west face of the Guadalupe Mountains here associated with a major fault zone here. And so it's been uplifted on the mountainside there and down faulted on the side that we're standing on over here. And by the way, we're standing on a salt flat out here, which is kind of cool too. So that is the Guadalupe Mountains right here. Guadalupe Peak is one of those peaks. I think Vittorio Peak is on here as well. So I think Victorio Peak is the one on the left and Guadalupe Peak is the one in the middle part there. So what you're really looking at or uh, there is a series of reefs and the four reef deposits. And so in fact, on the far right hand side of those cliffs, those are actually four reef or before in front of the reef deposits made out of carbonate still, but really pretty cool. And so those deposits made their way all the way into the basin. And in fact, they were shed from the reef itself and cast off into the basin. And so it's kind of neat. It's a, it's a little unit called the Raider Slide there. And so we're going to look at that here. If you're in a back reef setting, that means it's protected. And so the reef is taking all the wave activity and everything. And that's where all the nutrients are. And so reef dwelling organisms filter feed in that sort of setting, especially the brachiopods, right? But there were other things in there as well. So like there were snails, there were things, uh, weird things, in fact, in here. Uh, so, in fact, in that middle image here, that's actually a fracture that runs through the reef here. And there are a little tiny, a little tiny, two centimeter long, two and a half centimeter long, forams. Forams are single-celled organisms, but these are organisms that made little football-shaped sort of shells on them. And so, but one cell. One cell, single celled organism, so they're called foraminifera. It's a special type of foraminifera, a foraminifera and it's called a uh, fusilinid, so it's a type of fusilinid. Polydeoxidina is the name of that thing, so it's amazing I can pull that out, but it's such an unusual name, it's easy to remember for me. Polydeoxidina could be like two, almost three centimeters long, these things, and they lived in the reef setting because of the currents would actually wash through here. And these things, of course, had pseudopodia on the, on the exposed parts of their single cell, and they would be able to absorb nutrients out of the water that way. And, of course, other things would want to eat them if they could, but, of course, they were too big to be eaten by the brachiopods. But the smaller bits, the brachiopods could eat those, filter feed with the loaf of four, and be able to make a, a success out of that. So they find a lot of, uh, of cephalopods here as well. They find brachiopods. Uh, fusilinid forams. Um, so on the left hand side, those things look like like fossils, but they're not. They're actually called pyzolites. So those things actually form in very gentle water. They're not rolled around like ooids would be rolled around, but in fact these things may be altered a little bit, but they would actually put on a growth of cement and they would grow upward in the rocks this way. And so that is those Pyzolites, they are things that you would see in the parking lot in places like uh, Carlsbad Caverns. You would see pyzolites there. And you'd also see TP structures. We're going to look at a TP structure here in a minute. Uh, that's the polydeoxidina in the middle shot here where that's in the reef. And then the four reef setting is actually down where the road cuts around the south side of uh, Guadalupe National Park here. And so the highway through there cuts those road cuts that expose what's called the radar slide. So those are chunks of four reef material that were incorporated into really more or less basinal sort of carbonates. So the basinal carbonates are really, really organic rich. So I think it's called the Bone Springs Formation. So I don't have a photo of the Bone Springs on here, but it would be basinal carbonates. Now, really pretty cool rocks. Um, so here we have some more of the Raider slide. So you can actually see that Sam Hooker over here on the left hand side, him standing next to some rocks that were uh, deposited as part of that radar slide. Actually, at the very top of that, you see those bedded, thin bedded rocks up there. That's part of the bone spring there. If you break them open, you'd see that they're very dark. Um, in full, on the, on the right-hand side, you can actually see some of the debris flow uh, deposits you would get in that sort of basinal setting as well. So these are slide deposits off of that four reef sort of setting here. Oh, here's just a few more examples of what a beautiful fabric, a carbonate fabric, looks like in the Permian Reef Complex. Now, 
you might be suspicious that that in fact would be like basal rocks down here at the bottom but in fact those are things that were in a little protected area in that reef itself and so these spotty looking rocks like this in fact have a lot of of uh, cement in them and so i think that's actually a cement cavity uh that is filling with cement down here certainly on the lower left hand side that's a cement cavity that's been occluded by uh by carbonate cements here fascinating beautiful rocks that you see in guadalupe mountains uh, national park here here's a i have to show fossils that are you know megascopic fossil that's a knife down there for scale at the bottom but but here you can see a cephalopod here. So cephalopods are really interesting, very interesting mollusks, right? So that is a class of mollusk that looks a little bit like a nautiloid. In fact, these probably were not nautiloids. That was probably an ammonite right there. But in fact, they're like nautiloids that live today. So there's something like a squid that has a shell. And so if you look at nautilus is the name of the, of the common genus today that you find in the Pacific Ocean, a few other places around the world. But, but these are sort of places that you actually get um, cephalopods. This, I mean, cephalopods are really pretty smart animals, right? And so they have uh, the capacity to learn, and you know, they're very good hunters and, and things like that. These shells are segmented, so they can actually inflate or, you know, uh, or change the place their position in the water column. They would actually jet around with the the body that would ha be hanging off the bottom of that right and so here's your coil over the top and so the, the animal itself would then make jetting like this their means of locomotion or swimming they can also swim i think but this thing would actually be swimming in the water column it lived and died and then was preserved in this setting here in the permian reef um yeah so really kind of cool rocks Here's some more of these cement cavities. So one on the right-hand side is a cement cavity. It has fan-shaped cements in some of it. Uh, on the left-hand side as well. So, uh, yeah. So what do reefs look like? Well, they don't necessarily look like a framework structure. Not always, anyway. So, But these would have been brachiopod reefs for the most part. There could have been some, some sponges in there as well. I'm pretty sure there were some sponges as well. But brachiopods for sure. When we get into the back reef part, of Guadalupe Mountain National Park, you have to drive down the road a little bit. You, you go through a town called White City, and then you go a little bit farther, and you see this sort of feature right here. Or you visit it, you buy your ticket, and then you go in, and that's actually Carlsbad Cavern, looking out the entrance to Carlsbad Cavern. So you wind, wind your way down this walkway, and this is what it looks like on the inside. So it's it's been lit up here a little bit, and so that's the cave inside of the cave, but it's all in the back reef faces is what's interesting. And so you can actually see the rocks. So some of them are flat topped here, in fact. And so that's the actual roof of the cave right here. And you can see the beds over here on the left hand side. But that's also some of the way that you get in here. So it's a meandering path, you know, easy to get into, easy to look at. And here's some of the rocks in the interior. So you, you get some of these rocks that are actually back reef faces in here. And so very muddy sort of carbonate rocks here, not the high energy grade stones that you would get with lots of wave activity in the reef sort of setting, perhaps. And then, of course, you get speleothems, right? So if you have a cave, the first thing you do is you try to fill it up with other carbonate cements by eroding, <laughs> dissolving the carbonates around it and redepositing, redepositing them in speleothems like this. And so this is more of these. That's a column on the left-hand side. You can you can see a stalagmite, I think it is. Um, stalactite, stalagmite. I don't have to think about that. I think the stalagmites are on the bottom. Okay, stalactites at the top. Uh, here's a column over here on the right-hand side as well. And they have some of this sort of organ pipe fluting on here as well. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, carbonates or carbonates, right? And so most of that's probably aragonite. There may be some calcite in there as well. Now, here is that teepee structure I promised you uh, earlier as well. That's uh, uh, Michael Gant here. And so he's one of our former students as well. I think he worked for an oil company also. Maybe the same one that Brandon had worked for, who was uh, in the kayak back in the early, uh, early part of this presentation here. But that is a... Um, that's a teepee structure. So essentially what you have are cements that cause the rocks to be deformed like this. And in these little pools that are behind, and here are polygons essentially, they're like little, they're like mud puddles essentially, except they're in marine rocks. And you don't have any mud. 
you don't have any siliciclastic mud anyway. You have all carbonates in there, so you would form those piezoid grainstones in those puddles that were behind the teepee structures here. So kind of a neat shot here. You can see the actual uh, declivity on the uh, side that uh, the Michael Gant is on here. So the Permian saw this time also. And I've got some pictures of this. They're not my pictures. I've never been to Siberia yet anyway, so it may wind up there at some point, but probably not by choice. Uh, the Permian here is a place that saw a huge, massive outpouring of lava. And uh, it's known as the Siberian Traps. Now, let me explain that term for you. A trap is named for a Swedish word. Named, it's called trappa. And trappa actually means steps or stair steps, if you will. And so in Siberian Traps, that's where there's a whole series of stair steps of lava flows. These are flows of a basaltic sort of magma. So I think a little bit of it was actually andesitic as well in this. So there's some tufts and tuffites in here as well. But the Siberian traps is the largest outflowing of lava on the entire continent, the entire world in all the geologic time that we know of. So if there's this massive outpouring of lava, that volcanic eruption must be really important then in the environment, right? Well, yeah, so a lot of these gases were given off, and if you put out all that gas, in fact, what's it going to do? Well, if you put out too much CO2, in the remember, we had like, you know, we're not having forests anymore, okay? We're having deserts in the mid-continent region of North America in places like Oklahoma and Kansas. It's desert, <laughs> and in fact, what they find is there's a high acidity associated with these rocks as well. And so many of the carbonates that are right there at the end of the Permian become eroded. And even in ocean water, they would have gone into dissolution, perhaps. So people think that the oceans may have become very acidic. There's a, a rapid decrease in anything that would make its skeleton out of carbonate materials. So most of the shelly fauna, I think like 90% of the shelly faunas disappear at that extinction event. So this is the largest extinction event also in the, in the history of Earth. That we know of so far. In that, in that terminal Permian extinction, they also call it the Great Dying. Now people have looked everywhere for a meteorite impact with this, and they may have found one, but I tell you the evidence isn't clear yet that it is an impact, but we do have this clear evidence of a massive outpouring of lava in Siberian traps. And so there's this Here's the Siberian traps right here. You can see how big that area is. So that's Siberia just to the east of the Ural Mountains in Russia here. And that outpouring of lava um, would have changed the chemistry of the atmosphere, would have changed the chemistry of the oceans at that time. I have a friend who works in China, and in China you can actually preserve that uh, the, the Permian-Triassic boundaries actually preserved at the bottom of something called the Great Guizhou Bank. And you can actually see a dissolution surface at that, at that horizon. Now, we don't know how much rock is missing there because the rocks over the top were partially dissolved as well. People think that it could have stayed bad at, that in, you know, at this time, 252 million years ago. It could have stayed bad for 10 million years after this. So it wasn't a rapid recovery from this thing either. It would have been bad for a long period of time, very difficult for the organisms that made it through this. But in fact, you can thank our ancestors. They made it through this, right? So those, the first, <laughs> the first um, synapsids <laughs> that gave rise to the mammals, okay, so the stem group that did that. So those synapsids were able to survive this extinction event. Thank goodness. Or we wouldn't be here today. Or I'd be speaking some sort of like, you know, dinosaur dialect right now if the dinosaurs had survived it as well. They wouldn't have survived either, would they? Because they were in the, they're in the Mesozoic. And so, in fact, everything that made it through that extinction, there weren't that many things. <laughs> but it was particularly bad. I guess, I guess the land-dwelling uh, organisms could get away far enough, at least if you weren't around the Siberian traps, you might be able to make it. So if you're in the North American part of Pangaea at that time, you might have been able to make it. Um, yeah, fascinating, isn't it? 
things change very rapidly on Earth sometimes, and we don't always, we aren't always able to predict what's going to happen, but at least we have the evidence from ancient events that could give us a clue as to what if something like that were to happen today? It could, but it normally happens when you have massive supercontinents. Well, we don't have a massive supercontinent today, but we could still get large outpourings of lava. So maybe nothing that's ever going to be quite as big as the Siberian traps, at least not yet. So we're going to have to wait probably another 200 million years before we have another supercontinent, I hope, anyway. So that's what's in store sometime later for, for the uh, things that we are ancestral to. Okay, here's a photograph of the, uh, the step-like nature of the Siberian traps here. You can see where it snowed at the top, and you can see each of those individual flows, and they would have stacked up one after another, and so much of this, in fact, that's all from Siberia, and that's the Siberian traps there. So, welcome to the Terminal Permian, and yeah, goodbye. This is the worst mass extinction ever. Okay, so, anyway... Thanks for uh, this. Uh, I am going to try to get one more presentation up for you before Thursday. Um, I don't know that... What I want to do is I want to... I don't have to tell you this. Um, I want to have a quiz over f episodes 14 and 15 here. I, I said 16 in the last presentation, but this is actually 15. I may split this into two parts because it is is probably too long. At, a little over an hour now, right? Okay, so... but. At the same time, I don't want to wear you out, but at the same time, this is really important information. So I'm going to have to process overnight. It won't get loaded up till tomorrow, but I'd like to have a quiz on Thursday because that is the last day of classes. And then I may put together one more presentation to go on top of this to kind of wrap up the course because I think I owe it to, to you for that. Okay, so I'm going to have to cover a lot of ground in that last presentation, but that would be number 16 then. And so 16 will be the last of these presentations. That's roughly two a week. And I guess I was over optimistic when I started this. I thought I'd get in about 28 of these things. I'm thank, thank goodness I didn't because they take forever to do. I added up how many hours that I've worked on this project just teaching this second block class. And it's about 200, 180 to 200 hours that went into producing this coursework. Uh, just in the prep time. So anyway, thanks for your attention today, whenever you're watching this. And it's going to be up on YouTube, whether you like it or not, okay? So uh, it'll be up there, and uh, I'm going to wrap it up with the next one. So anyway, talk to you soon. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for your patience, too. I'm sorry it took so long to get these things loaded up, but it does take a lot of effort. So anyway, thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye now.